Hi, everybody, and welcome back to COGX. You are at the cyber and defense stage, and I'm your MC, Maria Purcell. So the title of our next session is Identity, Financial Crime, and Security. I hope you all have a cup of coffee, you're rested, you're comfy, and ready to go. I want to introduce our moderator for this session, who is Tara Wheeler. Tara is a Cybersecurity Policy Fellow at New America, and this year she will be a Fulbright Scholar at the University of Oxford. So if you see Tara, make sure you say hello and make her feel very welcome. So she should be joining us any moment now. Or not. I really hope she's not going to have me do this panel because I'm not sure I could carry the uh, whole panel on cybersecurity. So I'm going to need Tara to come in here and save the day. Hopefully this is us. <laughs> Tara, I thought you were going to leave me hanging there. I thought you were going to leave me to present this whole panel by myself. You can see me. There we are. There we go. Perfect. How are you doing? I'm doing wonderful. It wouldn't be a technology convention if there was a problem or two backstage. <laughs> Brilliant. Don't, don't leave me again. <laughs> All right. have, a, have a good session. Looking forward to it. All right, wonderful. Thank you so much, Maria. It's a pleasure to be here with you folks today. I am thrilled to be able to bring a panel to you for the discussion on identity, financial crime, and security that's going to hopefully be something that, that inspires new discussion and helps us to understand the interweavings of the way that who we are, what we do, what we buy, and how we keep ourselves safe is deeply, profoundly interconnected. It's a joy to bring to you today three incredible panelists. I'd love to have Fabian Eberly, uh, and here we are. There, hello Fabian, how are you doing this morning? Hello, I'm gonna hi. go ahead and bring panelists on one at a time and ask them to join us. Uh, so Fabian, it is lovely to have you here with us today. Would you please give uh, an introduction of yourself and also tell us a little bit more about you? Thank you very much, Tara, and all of you for tuning in today. Um, I'm Fabian, I'm a co-founder of Keyless. Um, aside from cybersecurity, I personally like all things sports. I grew up in Germany, and as you may expect, uh, I played football or soccer throughout my childhood and was always very interested in technology and studied business informatics and I worked with SAP and enterprise software before I joined a management consulting firm uh, in their business technology office, um, now McKinsey Digital. To today, we're together with my co-founders, Andrea Carmignani, with whom we conceived the idea during our MBA at INSEAD in 2018 and co-founded the company with professors Giuseppe Ateniese and Paolo Gasti, two renowned scholars in the fields of privacy enhancing technologies, network security, biometrics, and artificial intelligence, and many more amazing people who are very proud to work with uh, on our team to making a difference in digital identity and authentication. With Keyless, we are a deep tech cybersecurity company building passwordless privacy-preserving biometric authentication and personal identity management solutions for the workforce as a frictionless login, single sign-on, or biometric, universal biometric multi-factor, and for the consumers as a GDPR and PST2 compliant strong customer authentication capability that allows businesses to strongly authenticate their users with a simple look into the front-facing camera of any device, no matter what software or hardware platform. That is wonderful. All right. Thank you so much for that, Fabian. Tell us a little bit more about things that you do outside of cybersecurity. Is there something that you do on an everyday basis that keeps you entertained, keeps you filled with joy in this sometimes really stressful environment? Uh, well, uh, I'd like to I'd like to do sports. So I used to play soccer for, for a long time. Now it's, uh, I mean, pretty much anything that's possible. I mean, these days where we've all went virtual, um, mm -hmm. It's pretty much, uh, I mean, staying connected with close ones, uh, the team, uh, going for runs and just trying to keep staying healthy um, and carrying on with the great work we're doing at Keyless. I'm so glad to hear it. Thank you so very much, Fabian. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I would love to welcome now, if I could, Hussein Kasai. Hussein, I'd love to ask you to introduce yourself, to tell us a little bit more about you and tell us about the great work you're doing. 
Thank you. It's good to be on. So I'm one of the three co-founders and the CEO at Amfido. We set up the company eight years ago. As we could see, more and more organizations are moving online, and yet they don't have an easy way to verify that the people that they are onboarding are who they claim to be at the point of registration and on an ongoing basis. So we power around 1,500 organizations, and every time an online bank, for instance, wants to onboard a new customer, the customer is asked to take a photo of their government ID and a short selfie video, and then we use behind the scenes machine learning to verify it's a genuine ID and that it matches the individual so they can be onboarded. So our specific interest around identity and the security is very much uh, at the core of it and looking forward to the discussion. Mm, I'm so glad to hear it. Thank you. And then, of course, I'd absolutely love to know what is the kind of thing that you do on an everyday basis in your your everyday life to keep you happy and sane right at the moment in this kind of insane period in our <laughs> in the world? On a daily basis? Yeah. So I watch alternative media, YouTube media. Mm -hmm. uh, on the news to see, uh, kind of try to make sense of what's happening. And that is uh, your word around what helps you relax. It doesn't necessarily help me relax, but does help mm -hmm. me make sense of what's happening, at least a little bit more effectively. Yeah, it's hard to parse everything that's going on in the world. And it does, it does help to understand sometimes just seeing sort of that street raw level view of what's going on in the world. It's, it's pretty powerful. Um, I've seen some incredible footage out there. And while I wouldn't, as you say, call it relaxing. At least it does help us make some more sense of the world that we're in right now. Thank you so very much, Hussein. I really appreciate it. Uh, I'd love to welcome onto the stage now, if I could, Ellison and Williams. Ellison, if you could tell us a little bit more about yourself and the incredible company that brings you here today. Excellent. Thanks so much, Tara. So yes, my name is Ellison and Williams. I'm the CEO and founder of Invail. So Unveil as a company is about three and a half years old and we are a data security company protecting data in use to enable secure and private data search, analytic sharing and collaboration. So through our breakthroughs and homomorphic encryption, which is often considered to be that holy grail of crypto, we enable searches and analytics to be encrypted and run anywhere our software is installed without ever decrypting them at any point during the processing life cycle, which completely changes the paradigm of how and where organizations can securely and privately leverage data assets. So before starting in Vail about three and a half years ago, I spent the majority of my career inside of the US intelligence community and the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab. And before that, I was busy collecting a lot of degrees. So a PhD in pure math, a master's in math and a master's in computer science and machine learning before it was ever cool. <laughs> before it was ever cool, we're gonna get along great. <laughs> All right, so now I, I, I do like collecting degrees. That's a fun thing to do, but tell me a little bit more about what you do on an everyday basis to stay sane right at the moment. It's hard well, with those of us that like playing team sports and stuff like that. So what do you do for fun right at the moment? <laughs> Correct, so at the moment, we're at, actually fostering a retired racing greyhound. So oh. we had adopted a retired racing greyhound a while back and kind of fell in love with the breed. And now we're teaching this foster dog what life is like off of the track. So what is a window? No, you don't walk through it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That sounds like a blast. Now that it's is fun. a way to keep entertained. Uh, yeah. make, make YouTube videos of that. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> he has an Instagram account. <laughs> Our foster I dog. believe you. <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Thank you so much. Look forward to speaking further today, Ellison. So I'd love to uh, to, to begin today's uh, more deep question and and, uh, and discussion session by talking a little bit about some of the individual questions that each of our specialists can talk about on a personal level, and we'll start to bring this together towards the middle the middle of the panel. I'd love to begin with Fabian, if I possibly could. So I have uh, have have had a chance to meet our panelists behind the scenes, and Fabian's work is incredibly interesting. Uh, the work that he's doing uh, and that um, that Keyless is doing on the idea of biometric uh, encryption and storage and verification of identity is is a fascinating one. And one of the questions that I had warned him in advance I was going to ask as, a, as someone who's in security myself, it's important to understand uh, biometrics are, are low or no entropy. Functionally, for instance, fingerprints have no entropy and a face has very low entropy. Like I could take my glasses off and put them back on again, but it's pretty hard to change your face. So how do you rotate credentials when the credentials are you? 
Yeah, thank you very much, Taryn. Your question highlights the underlying challenge for digital identities and authentication more broadly, which is the trade-off between security and privacy on the one side and convenience and a consistent personal experience on the other side. And when it comes to authentication, an act we're all involved in multiple times on a daily basis where we verify or prove our claimed identity that we initially established uh, and had verified when we opened our accounts. Generally, uh, we talk about three main authentication factors, a possession factor, something we have, such as our device or hard token, a knowledge factor, something we know as our passwords or pins, uh, and something, um, an inherence factor, as in something or who we are, um, such as our physical or uh, behavioral biometrics. And I agree with you that biometrics, specifically fingerprint or face biometrics, are no or low entropy compared to passwords, which in theory are much more um, secure and robust. Um, but we know from what we know from practice is that people don't follow password best practices. We all choose passwords that are easy to remember. Uh, in most cases, we reuse our passwords all across the internet. What is also true is that in practice, passwords um, are in fact the reason for more than 80% of all data breaches, um, for about 50% of all help desk calls. Uh, which make a simple password reset as costly as $70 uh, for an enterprise on average. So in the end, if you were to use a biometric sample or a password as the only factor for authentication, um, they're actually both relatively insecure on their own. The point you raised though is important. Um, one way to mitigate that password risk is that we um, generally believe that um, it is a good use to rotate passwords on a consistent or regular basis. There's also research that shows um, that this has mediocre effects on security where people tend to continue to choose passwords that are easy to remember and thus easy to guess. Um, but it is totally true that this is impossible to do with biometrics. You can't rotate your biometric information as you only have one face or you only have one fingerprint. So in, in general, it's a very bad idea to first expose biometric data publicly or even worse storing biometric data in a central database. Um, so in order to perform stronger authentication, one needs to combine multiple authentication factors. In fact, this is what PSD2 and our European open banking framework for, for strong customer authentication requires typically combining your device um, where you generate um, a pin code, a secure banking app, where you have it delivered to an insecure text or email and your password that you choose and remember, which may also be secured on the user side through local biometrics that unlock your secret, such as your password that you then share with the dependent party as the bank you want to log on or the payment that you want to authorize um, on your mobile device. So at the end, you're trading um, stronger security at the expense of an inconvenient, inconsistent and relatively impersonal process. And what we are pioneering with Keyless are several breakthroughs in the areas of secure, private, and distributed biometric authentication that are based on more than 10 years of research in cryptography and biometrics, where we set out on this mission to enable anyone to seamlessly access any digital service from any device while keeping your personal information safe, private, and under your control. And the way we do it is by combining secure, privacy-enhancing technologies, predominantly secure multi-party computation, with machine learning and multimodal biometric authentication methods that offer a multi-channel and universally consistent biometric authentication experience through the cloud that's accessible from any device, no matter what hardware vendor or software platform, without storing that biometric data in a central database that needs to be rotated with the privacy and security guarantees of local authentication technologies such as Apple's Touch, or face ID systems where you as a user enroll your biometric template on one particular device, which in turn marries you to this one device you can use. And from a company's perspective, you completely give up control over the authentication experience and become dependent on the end user device your employee or user is using. So with Keyless, you have a system where there's nothing stored on the user's device. Neither is there anything stored on a central uh, database on the server side. We're not involving any personal identifiable information in the process, which makes the system private by design and thus compliant with privacy regulations such as GDPR. And it is also truly passwordless and multi-factor by design, which complies to the strong customer authentication requirements under PSC2. And most 
importantly, it unifies the user experience across devices, across the entire enterprise, and all customer touch points. So coming back to your- I'm gonna definitely have a question on that one. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I do believe biometrics when done right uh, are the answer to, to solving the authentication trade-off and aligning a seamless user experience with a stronger security and built-in privacy. And the te technology exists today um, and we're looking forward to helping organizations adopt a more convenient, personal, reliable and secure way for authenticating their users and employees, uh, especially now as we've all been accelerated into the digital future um, that may ultimately converge with our physical lives and thus unavoidably with who we are and our biometrics. It's very true. One of the things I thought as I was listening to you is DNA is the ultimate zero entropy identification factor. I do suppose the, the follow up question that I want to ask though is it's, it's fine to not store that information and indeed a, probably a pretty good idea, but what you described was secure multi-part computation. Uh, I suppose, again, the question I would ask is if you're beginning with the same seeds of face, uh, hands, eyes, any of the any biometrics, if you're beginning with the same seed with low or no entropy, can you recalculate the multi-part computation that you're doing for biometric identification? Yes, and this is the secret uh, sauce or magic that we uh, bring to the market, similar to what mm -hmm does with uh, fully homomorphic encryption, which solves a different problem where you have massive mm -hmm. amount of data for private computation. Biometric sure. authentication only involves a very low uh, number of data. You could compare it as mm -hmm. a ultra large crude carrier on the one side and the speed bar on the other side, where you look at a screen, boom, you're locked in and done. And the way we do it is that we um, essentially extract biometric features when you look into a camera, split them in pieces, mm -hmm encrypt these pieces locally on the device. And then we're matching these one-way encrypted shares of users' faces against those that you have initially enrolled with our platform, which also yeah. verifies the device in the background and for liveness um, as well. But you have this multi-factor biometric security process um, authenticating you in a fraction of a second uh, without having to store mm -hmm. any info in any place at the same time. Well I'm definitely gonna to wanna to come back to you again on this one, Fabian, it's a fascinating question and concept and I can certainly see a lot of places I would have questions. I do wanna give Ellison now a chance to jump into the conversation as I ask. Um, Ellison, one of the things that, that we had discussed in advance about asking you, especially given Enveil's uh, opportunity to use homomorphic encryption, uh, it's, it's fascinating to see the uh, the commitment that encryption and cryptography companies have towards solving um, issues of of criminality online. And the original question that I was going to ask you, as you know, is how important is government cryptographic research to letting people in the community like you develop uh, strong encryption? And second of all, how does someone who is in a company advocate for the use of this kind of, of encryption? Homomorphic encryption, to the best of my ability to tell, means you can simply do computational operations on ciphertext as opposed to simply plain text and repeat your results while retaining security. Is this correct? Can you explain a bit more? Correct. Um, and so Thank to you. answer the, the first part of your question just mm -hmm. a little bit, so Thank all you. research in, in cryptography is important, regardless of where that's going to come from in terms of academic or government types of sources. So that's all important and then all needs to be evaluated very rigorously. Homomorphic encryption is a very special and powerful type of encryption. That's why it's often to consider that holy grail that I talked about a second ago, because it allows you to perform computations in the encrypted domain. So in ciphertext space, as you pointed out, as if it were in the plain text or uh, unencrypted world. So you can do things like ultimately use those building blocks that homomorphic encryption provides and encrypt searches and analytics and machine learning models and run them anywhere without ever decrypting anything. So very, very powerful as an underlying technology. Now, just to touch on something that was talked about just a second ago in a broader umbrella, there's a category of technologies called privacy enhancing technologies. And so fundamentally, there are a family of technologies that enable and enhance and preserve the privacy of data throughout its entire life cycle. So most often today, it's used to refer to technologies that preserve the security and privacy for the usage of data when it's being used or processed. So you heard just a second ago that one of those uh, technologies that he mentioned was SMPC or Secure Multi-Party Compute. Another mm -hmm. of those technologies is homomorphic encryption. 
And there are others in this family that really enable data to be shared in a very secure and private way. Wonderful. The, the next question I would have for you along those lines is, there's a big challenge in many parts of the world involving governments pushing for weakening encryption. And I know this is a question you've got to be sick of right now. And, and I think we all are in the security space at this point, but I do want to understand a little bit more from you about how you have helped to advocate for Unveil and for homomorphic encryption or any of these technologies, any privacy enhancing technology like secure multi-party compute, any, any of the ways that we have of obfuscating or of hiding the meaning of words becomes encryption uh, or of communications altogether. How do you advocate for the use of these technologies to help solve financial crimes, to help solve problems that are found in gov and public space, as opposed to simply being seen sometimes as a block to solving them? Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, mm -hmm. I am a huge advocate for transparency and cryptography. So it's very, mm -hmm. very important to be transparent, to be auditable, to be verifiable at every step. And certainly we do that as a company. So I always tell people, if anybody's out there peddling you proprietary crypto, just turn and run in the <laughs> other direction. So it's got to be absolutely transparent. And crypto cryptography is very powerful. So one of the ways that we've seen it be immensely powerful for us as a company is in the way we see financial services institutions leveraging our capabilities for secure and private search and analytics in the area of anti-money laundering. So in particular, the area of know your customer and customer due diligence. So we allow a financial services institution to gain additional insights in a secure and private way through encrypting those searches and analytics and never decrypting them across its operating jurisdictions or from other participating banks for onboarding to make it get more informed decisions for onboarding that would have otherwise never been possible due to privacy regulations or competitive dynamics. And we can certainly dive more into what that looks like, but we are using this um, today. We're seeing it be very effective in combating anti-money laundering. And in particular, our solutioning around this um, was uh, able to be showcased at the FCA's tech sprint back in the summer of 2019, where we won that use case for KYC CDD, and then also won the corresponding tech sprint out in the US. So that is an example of transparent, cryptography solutioning for greater social good. And for those folks who are uh, who are not as familiar with the mathematical elements of cryptography, can you describe, uh, I think one of the questions that might come up with someone who's less familiar with the field is what do we mean by transparent cryptography? Does that mean we can understand it, that we can recreate it later? What What is the piece that lets cryptography both be transparent and secure when it comes to maintaining, for instance, keys or, or the technology that you're using in homomorphic encryption? How do you have transparent cryptography that isn't transparent to the naked eye? Yeah, absolutely. So you want to create certain verification points within any kind of solutioning that's levering, leveraging any kind of cryptography. So you want to be transparent about the algorithms, cryptographic algorithms that you're using, uh, transparent about the implementation of those. So being able to offer up um, that source code where the cryptography has been implemented and to have it examined by a third party or examined by the customer base to have them verify that. And then for us as a company, in addition to those things, we've also built frameworks around audit and verification for our products. So making it a lot um, more accessible for a security person or functionality within an organization to be able to, in a very methodical way, test and verify and make sure that the cryptography and the configurations and the products and solutioning are doing exactly what we said they do. Thank you. That third party auditing capacity is incredibly important. I appreciate that. That gives us a great opportunity to now move over into asking Hussein a couple of questions. Uh, Ellison brought up a wonderful point about how we store information, look at it securely and make use of it. One of the, the biggest questions that came to mind as I looked at the work of Onfido was, what is the responsibility of government and private industry in partnership to protect metadata and the derived biometrics from the kinds of, of uh, of financial criminals that we're all looking to defend against, while at the same time enabling legitimate users to access their finances. How do we how do we have our cake and eat it too on this one? How do you store information and keep it safe and use it against criminals at the same time? Uh, Hussein, looks like you're silent. Yeah, sorry, is this better? There we go. So there we go. To put it in context first, 
you have half the world's adult population who are financially excluded and aren't able to access any of the services that we take for granted, making a simple payments or taking a small loan and things of that nature. And that's a shame and it's predominantly because they can't effectively be identified and they carry therefore money laundering uh, and compliance risks. And then you have, that's the access problem. And then you have the security challenge where the United Nations estimates that up to 5% of the world GDP is laundered money. And that is using human trafficking, drug trafficking, terrorist financing, that's almost $2 trillion. So you have all the financial institutions who want to, for the most part, grant access to more people, but yet they're not able to because there's a, a challenge with the effectively being able to identify that they are who they claim to be. So the role that um, the government and private sector, and, and I suppose your question around responsibility, uh, it fundamentally comes down to regulation, but effective regulation. And that across the world, there are different regulators with different objectives. And some have the objective, the sole objective of consumer protection. And that's a laudable and an understandable objective to have. But you can fulfill that objective by stopping all innovation. And that's a bit of an issue. because, Well, if there's no innovation at all, there's no risk. And therefore, there's no risk of further abuse. But... More, more progressive regulators, specifically the UK, for example, with the Financial Conduct Authority, have not just protection, but also competition and innovation as part of their objectives. So they can very closely monitor and observe new innovation, take it a step at a time, and essentially help consumers gain best access to services and new services while protecting other consumers at the same time. So the question around storage and um, risks of abuse, GDPR has assisted to some extent, making sure there's greater transparency and, and consumers have greater rights, and also for organizations to reconsider and think, what data do they really need? So a big part of our approach is a private, having a private server per user, so that once an individual is verified, they are able to store their personal information on a private server that only they can access, and then they can provide an access to other organizations that just need to see a yes or no on whether they are who they claim to be, essentially, which is part of our portable identity work um, that we're doing. And there is one final piece that is relevant here, and that is the issue with the back door. So specifically with the very larger companies that do store information and increasingly amounts uh, of, of sensitive and, uh, information for more people, as in when you have intelligence community and other organizations asking them to have a backdoor so that they have a back channel way of gaining access to that data, that poses mm -hmm. risks. So an ideal state would be to have minimal data and preferably have as much of that uh, stored by the individual so that it's not accessible or uh, it reduces the risk of abuse uh, and specifically forces from stealing it. I'm glad to hear it. Uh, now, as, as somebody who is, has been on both unfortunate sides of that conversation that Ellison and I were having about third party auditing, I think one of the biggest questions I immediately have, Hussein, is it, does, if every individual has a private server and you're minimizing data, uh, how are you minimizing your own ability at Onfido to access that data? Is the individual with whatever your technology is the only one that can access that server or can you as well? So the individual, by using their biometric, would produce a private mm -hmm to grant access to their data so that mm -hmm. they're always in the driving seat. Any organization they want to provision access to has to be channeled by them in order to access it so that a third party or a fraudster uh, wouldn't be able to impersonate them and access that, that same data. And by ultimately putting the data in the individual's hands and control, then you're mitigating a lot of these risks. Because ultimately, what is the alternative? The one is for the government to store and own that data, and we've heard of all the breaches and challenges there. The other is for private companies to store it. We know about the credit bureaus and the breaches that have happened, or hotels, and every other week there's a new story of a breach, unfortunately. And as the breaches increase, it exponentially increases the likelihood of you being the victim of identity theft, because fraudsters can again uh, have a greater number of uh, breaches to, to buy your data. And mm -hmm. Ultimately, it should be the user that owns and stores it, but done in a very user convenient way so that they don't need to go through uh, many clicks to make it happen. When you threat model for your individual users, the people using the, these kinds of individual identity wallets is, is the way that I've, I've perpetually thought about them. Do you think of yourself as a potential, uh, a potential attack vector for your individual users' identities? 
And that's, well, the point is, is it's similar to the, the sort of keyless approach in that you mm -hmm. figure it in a way so that there's no point of failure, that ultimately without that person's facial biometric, there would not be a, any way of granting access. So then it, the mm -hmm. question becomes how accurate and how good can you be at assessing and detecting a person's face and ensuring that they are who they came to be. Naturally, that's what uh, our area of expertise is. Fair enough. All right. I thank you for answering the questions. And I definitely want to come back, I think, exactly to, to that point with Fabian as well. If we get the chance to, Fabian, I'd love to ask you to follow up on some of what uh, Ellison and Hussein have, have told us about not only how to store, but uh, how to store information, but what to store. At Keyless, I know we've had this question. Uh, I've had this question for you before about how you store and work with user data. Let me ask you: When you combine the conversation we've heard so far, how can Keyless or technologies that involve uh, secure multi-party compute um, reduce the potential for financial crime um, across borders? Have you had this conversation in terms of GDPR yet? Yeah, so what <clears throat> what you can do with with Keyless? What we're doing is <clears throat> essentially authenticating someone, meaning um, claiming or authenticate, verifying <clears throat> against the claimed identity that, for example, you've established and onboarded with Onfido uh, and had the identity verified against the government issued ID. What we do with Keyless is, <clears throat> first of all, um, I think what um, Hussein said, just said, um, I, I totally agree. What we, we take it a step further in the way that we involve multiple factors in that one look process, and we're not only doing biometric authentication, but what happens under the hood is biometrically enabled key management where we're regenerating, reconstructing, and recombining your personal private key on the device that you can then use to uh, generate an authentication token to log in uh, or authorize a payment um, or sign a digital signature after that secret disappears. So when it comes to storage, um, we don't want to store any personal information. Uh, what we do is, mm -hmm. We first verify the device through a simple zero knowledge proof and a secret we generate on the device that doesn't leave the device as the independent first factor. But then using the face um, with the secure multi-party computation compute for biometric matching that doesn't involve personal identifiable information, but we extract the biometric feature. Uh, we then split that in pieces, encrypt these pieces locally on the device, uh, which in the encryption key isn't dependent on the biometrics. And then we're storing these during the enrollment, these one-way encrypted shares of your face, which don't represent uh, your biometric data anymore in various pieces on the distributed cloud infrastructure that we run and host. Um, but <clears throat> after that, um, we're also verifying liveness to ensure you're a real human being and not a video or picture. And we're taking this uh, another step forward with including uh, multiple modalities of a given factor, as in involving a physical biometric as your face, which is interoperable across all device that has a front-facing camera with something that is unique to you and your behavior, such as keystroke dynamics, or the way you swipe on the screen to further harden the security in the authentication process. And if you would want to compromise this, you would need to have uh, to own the, one of the user's devices that is linked to that account. You need a fresh life sample of the user's face and mimic their behavior, which um, gets close to impossible. It does get close to impossible, and that's that's going to be a conversation we can have in future about the idea of deep fakes. We've had a couple of questions actually come up uh, on the idea of what what the future of cryptography is going to be. I see a great question here asking, uh, this is Mr. Basinski, uh, what is the legal status uh, or framework, including GDPR, of using pools of this kind of data across uh, uh, various institutions, but most interestingly, across jurisdictions, how does Keyless uh, respond to requests from governments that may uh, have different perspectives on legal frameworks and the use of identity and identity sharing among their institutions? How do you respond to that, especially as a, as a younger company? It's often challenging to, to work across jurisdictions. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. We're actually engaging with the regulator as well, but the nice mm -hmm. thing the keyless biometric is that we uh, are not classifying as personal <clears throat> identifiable information with the biometric per se. So what GDPR or any other privacy regulation says is how you treat personal information. But once you don't involve personal information in the first place, uh, this data sits beyond or outside of these regulatory schemes. Um, so it's basically nonsensical data that doesn't relate or doesn't link to any personal um, or human being. But at the time where myself as 
Fabi and I own a bank account ahead of the verified ID they used on FIDO in the onboarding. Um, and I can link the keyless authentication to my account, which is essentially makes an authentication step, an identification step across every customer touch point the bank has with myself. Um, the biometric itself uh, is not personal, but the linkage to me as a real world identity and a real human being uh, does make it, um, doesn't include in these, in these privacy uh, frameworks. But as long as it, uh, as what the biometric uh, data concerns is um, that it is completely um, uh, opaque uh, and, and doesn't resemble personal information. Very interesting. Uh, thank you. That leads us into the last question that I'll ask before I open it up to a little bit more of a broad discussion among the panelists and we have a, a bit of a roundtable. Uh, and this is going to be a question in combination for Ellison and for Hussein. This is uh, the, the thing that does keep coming up again and again is jurisdictional frameworks, but also regulatory frameworks. One of the challenges we in security and privacy often have is that our technology far outpaces the ability of any regulator to actually regulate us effectively. Uh, GDPR was a wonderful step in a lot of good directions in terms of providing customers power over their data. But the truth is, is that the, the power of biometrics, of homomorphic encryption, the power that rests in our hands is often something that is far beyond the ken of most regulators or their ability to regulate it. Um, the question I would have for you is, for each of your companies, um, uh, both in Vail and on Fido, how do you take uh, the responsibility for your customers and understand that regulators may never catch up to your level of innovation, but take that responsibility in mind when it comes to storing and using your customers' data? that regulators may never catch up to your ability to do what you want to do. What is your personal and, and professional and company-wide ethical stance on storage of data and using it to keep people safe? And let's start with Ellison, if we could. Yeah, no, that's a great question. So as you pointed out before and talked a little bit about, um, the global demand for privacy has never been greater than it is today. And we've seen all the regulatory landscape follow suit with GDPR and host of other regulations across the globe. And that just speaks to the importance of technologies in that category of privacy enhancing technologies that really do enable data to be used and shared and collaborated with and on while still respecting all of that security and privacy. And one of the most powerful aspects of privacy enhancing technologies like homomorphic encryption or like SMPC is that they enable a completely decentralized form of privacy preserving data sharing and collaboration, meaning that each organization, each entity can retain positive control of their data assets within their walls and still enable that secure searching and collaboration to be possible. So just for example, in the area of anti-money laundering or know your customer, for cross-jurisdictional use, so you've got multiple jurisdictions, both that have different privacy, secrecy regulations, or data residency requirements associated with them. So a bank can initiate an encrypted query containing regulated information within one jurisdiction, send it simultaneously across its other operating jurisdictions, have it processed in those jurisdictions without ever decrypting it, and thus without ever exposing that regulated information, return the encrypted results, decrypt, and feed them back into their onboarding processes for more advanced decisioning that they would have otherwise never been able to attain absent these kinds of breakthroughs and the capabilities. And so in terms of working with the regulators to that end, it's our job as solution providers in that family of privacy enhancing technologies to work hand in hand with the regulators and make sure that they not only understand the power of these capabilities, but understand enough of the technical detail that they can verify and they can understand how it hooks into their audit and oversight types of rules and requirements. So for example, I talked about this a little bit before, we've seen the FCA or the Financial Conduct Authority lean very far forward into this family of technology. So the entire tech sprint last summer was focused on privacy enhancing technologies and their power to really transform uh, anti-money laundering, which is a huge problem. It claims 2% of the global GDP. So we worked hand in hand with the FCA and the ICO, so the privacy authority out in the UK, and then simultaneously working with the US. So we're seeing more and more of these regulatory bodies lean into the power of this family, tech, uh, family of technologies as we work with them to educate them. 
Thank you so much. I'd love to have Hussein jump in as well and talk about what is what what your responsibilities are as an innovator in this field and uh, and how do you handle regulatory frameworks as well like this? Absolutely. So, so you had two parts to this: is work with the regulator and the responsibility mm -hmm. both on an mm -hmm. and a company standpoint. Um, when it comes to so on the second piece first, we have uh, four building blocks as a company: granting access, helping fraudsters. Uh, making it as user friendly as possible and upholding privacy. So at, at, as, as core from the outset, it, it's been built in and it's super important to us. When it comes to how do you make that happen, naturally we are what you call a reg tech. So we're not directly regulated ourselves, but our technology is used by companies. Uh, two thirds of our client base are financially regulated, for instance. So they need to be regulated, but we're naturally a tool that helps them uh, ensure that they are uh, compliant. Now, the way that we see that is, is as um, we just mentioned, heavy and close work with the regulators. We were part of the first UK um, uh, FCA regulatory sandbox, and we're, we were part of the most recent one, the fifth cohort. We were also part of the Information Commissioner's Office um, sandbox around privacy, gifting and others. And the more closely you're able to work with regulators, as they are now enabling uh, organizations of all sizes to get involved, specifically uh, another sandbox framework, then the better because the innovators are able to innovate. The regulators are able to both observe and more importantly, learn with fast uh, loops of iteration. And if it's mainstream institutions, banks, insurance companies and others, they're all in the loop. And this is a, a, a in our experience, by far the best way to do it. And there's also why the, model, the UK model is being adopted by more and more countries across the world from the regulatory and at specifically innovation standpoint. Thank you. It's important to make sure that that, uh, that cooperation occurs as well as that deep sense of personal responsibility and, and company-wide sense of responsibility is, as well set the tone. Um, I would love to open this up. We've got a few minutes left in this panel and I'd love to see if any of you have any questions you'd like to ask each other, any thoughts that you have as we as we go forward. I've got a couple of question cues here, but I have the feeling we all we all have plenty of things to say. Does anybody want to jump in with any thoughts that they have not had a chance to voice yet? You got yeah, three more seconds before I, I open the topic up to quantum computing. Go. <laughs> we can go Fair quantum. Enough. We can go quantum. All right. We're going to go quantum. I love to ask the question, uh, as we all have this conversation about privacy enhancing technologies, is quantum computing the bomb that's going to blow up cryptography in five years? Which is the best way I've ever asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> Who thinks that quantum computing is going to have some deep impacts on the work that you're doing? I think it will have deep impact. I don't think it's going to be a bomb that blows things up. Uh, there are quantum resistant variants of cryptography, including of homomorphic encryption. So the power of that type of crypto will continue to develop, uh, but definitely it will be a shift. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any thoughts on this one? I, I've noted for those of us who, who are kind of more boots on the ground keyboards, uh, one of the greatest things I've heard said is a, a friend of mine, John Callis, once said that the issue with quantum computing is that it's not a math problem, it's an applied engineering problem. And we just have the, the, the power in future, hopefully, to stabilize qubits long enough to use them for this kind of work. I, I hope it continues to contribute to the work that you're doing. Oh, gosh, that hurts my heart. I'll have to call John. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> It is, it's a fascinating thought though. We, we, we live in the world of ones and zeros, but they all are still electrical impulses and glass fiber and physical interactive keyboards as clicky as possible on those keyboards. So any thoughts on quantum, uh, quantum cryptography and quantum computing and how that might affect the future? I'd especially love to know in terms of the processing speed for you, Fabian, and the uh, the SMPC, do you feel like that's going to speed up or uh, create a sidetrack of additional kinds of computing? Well, it could potentially speed up the computing. In fact, we're working on <clears throat> another protocol that we call BAKE, Biometric Authenticated Key Exchange, uh, that allows mm -hmm. for the, the generation of your personal cryptographic key out of the fuzzy biometric input without the reliance on a public key infrastructure uh, that we'll bring mm -hmm. to market in the coming months. Uh, but another comment that I wanted to make, as you mentioned, deep fakes uh, and GANs in relation to, to privacy, enhancing technologies, which is actually another area of innovation um, we're working on where we're using this technology behind deepfakes to generate 
pictures of human beings to train uh, the machine learning algorithms for the biometric authentication in a way that preserves the privacy and actually creates pictures of people that you can use to train uh, the algorithm but don't exist uh, in the real world, which is the huge limitation when it comes to ethnicity, age, et cetera, mm -hmm. around biometric data sets. There's a lot of potential with that. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential in everything that we've discussed today. I love the idea of being able to train machines in a new and interesting way that helps to compensate for some of the issues we face as humans in terms of bias. This has uh, been an incredible conversation. I know that uh, our wonderful MC Marie is gonna be joining us again soon. And I wanna thank you all so very much for the time and energy that you've put into this conversation today. For those folks listening today, we look forward to being able to answer more of your questions very soon. Looks like in about 15 minutes, we'll be around. and. Uh, Thank you so much, very much to all the panelists. Of course, Maria. Great, thank you, Tara. That was brilliant. Uh, really, really interesting to, to hear you guys uh, going on about the uh, different aspects of the topic that we had. Um, like Tara mentioned, we do have a short break, but then we'll be back at three o'clock. Tara will be leading the Q&A session. I have to pop off because I'm doing another session. So I love you and leave you in the capable hands of Tara, but we will see you in 15 minutes right back here uh, for more Q&A with the panel.